Hey friends, thanks for joining me, Jim Baroud, to hear a few insights from leaders who represent our innovation ecosystem. Today's chat is with Mike Krupit, the founder and CEO of Trajectify, and Dom Farnan, the founder and CEO of Dot Connect. So why don't we talk about, uh, ladies first, Dom, tell us about yourself and, and how you've, you know, where you, what you've done and how you got to what you're doing now and what are you doing now? What's your role? Yeah, sure. Um, so my name is Dom Farnan. I'm in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, I've been recruiting for almost 20 years. I started recruiting when I was 17, graduated high school early, became a recruiter kind of by accident and then just loved that career path and stayed with it. And so I'm the founder and CEO now of dot connect, which is my company. Um, I really built my business from being a solopreneur. So end of 2018, I had nine clients and a few part-time people helping me. We grew that business up to now we've got about 20 clients and 60 people globally on my team. And we help other businesses build their high-performing team. Mike, go ahead. Great. Good, good afternoon. I'm Mike Krupit. I'm the founder and lead coach at Trajectify. Um, I'll tell you what we do in a moment, but my the Trajectify comes out of 25 years and eight startups in Silicon Valley and here in the uh, Philadelphia and New York region. Uh, everything from tech companies to automotive company to a food company. And one of the things I learned early in my career is that, is that leadership skills are transferable, whereas technical skills are not. And so I honed my le- leadership skills to the point where I went from CTO to COO to, CO, uh, to CEO and spent the uh, latter part of my career running uh, companies. And you know, today with Trajectify, what we do is we coach founders of growth stage companies and turn them into CEOs help them developing their strategy, their team, their, their competency, competencies and confidences as a leader. Um, I'm also uh, one of the co-founders of the Philly New Tech Meetup, and I'm on the board of the Philadelphia Israel Chamber of Commerce. So I bring a big community aspect to a lot of the work I, I wanna do with entrepreneurial companies. Well, Don, let's, let's flip back to you. Uh, obviously, mm-hmm. you know, your, what you've done entrepreneurially, entrepreneurially is pretty impressive. Um, talk about your personal journey a little bit more, just so people have some context. You know, people may not know what, what goes on in recruiting as a, as a yeah. business, but clearly you can speak about what it is and then growing that out into a company. Yeah. I think what I thought was interesting about recruiting, even back when I had my first interview with the VP of HR that hired me, was just having conversations with different people. Like you never have the same interview twice. So that's really what's kept me interested in it for 20 years. Um, I learn a lot from candidates. I learn a lot about different types of roles and functions and things that people do, random jobs that I would have never even guessed in my life that I probably hired for. Um, And I think that's exciting. We actually did a vision building day yesterday with my leadership team. And we talked about like, what is the future vision for our organization and why do we why are we still doing this? Like for me, this was everything I ever knew, but then my newbies and my new team, you know, why would they be interested? And it's just about human connection. What kept coming up for us is, is, you know, redefining recruiting to be conscious connectors. So I'm doing a lot of inner healing work and self-development and self-discovery. And I've been on this spiritual journey for a few months. Mike, you know, I talked about it before and before I was like, Oh, I'm kind of on it. It's weird. I don't want to tell people now I'm like, I'm so proud of it. So I'm saying it with pride and, and, and happiness, but um, it's, it's been hard. Two years ago, when I started my business and grew my team, I had never managed people. I was always the best recruiter on every team, and I was always high-level senior individual contributor. So like going from that to then delegating work and trying to elevate myself was really hard. I was completely psycho control micromanagement boss, and so it took a lot of inner work and self-development coaching, masterminds, just complete continuous education for me. And even now, still to this day, like I'm just still a humble student and learning everything I can about myself and about others to show up as a better leader for my team and for our clients and the candidates that we serve. So it's been a wild and a couple crazy years and a lot of self-learning and reflection. 
That's great. Thank you for that. And and Mike, tell us, you know, give us a little more color on, on you know, doing so many things. So, uh, but different than Dom, which, uh, you know, I think can complement the conversation here. Well, you know, Dom, Dom's story is, is, is a common one. Not that, not that Dom is very common, but, or, nor a company, but, but it, it it's it's about understanding how do we shift from that role from founder to CEO at some point and 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 so when I shared a little bit about my journey as a you know going from CTO to to um, to a CEO in, in my introduction, um, you know really what I've learned is that it's the team it's the people that's the heart of every company that that's that what is what will determine your level of success or not. Lots of other factors, right? We, Jim and you and I are, earlier were talking about timing and luck, right? And certainly those don't hurt if, if they're aligned with you, but without the right people and without the right leadership that helps, that helps guide the people, um, you know, there, there, is, there, there, is no, there is no company, right? There is no, there is no growth. And so for me, that each subsequent role that I took in my career, kind of honed my skills that way. CD Now was the biggest one, right? That was the one where I joined. We were a couple of years old. There were 40 people. They said, hey, we need to bring in some people who've managed before, some professional managers. So they brought in me. They brought in someone in, in, um, in marketing. They brought in me on tech and someone else in marketing. We doubled every six months. And um, it, within a few years, we were seven, over 700 people. And, and talk about, you know, the um, going, going public and merging with our closest competitor and nearly going bankrupt and selling the company and taking it private and working for a corporate behemoth um, as, you know, it, within a five-year span, right? That was an MBA, right? That was an, anyone who lived through that, that was an MBA. And so um, very much like Dom, you know, the entrepreneurial journey um, for any of us is not just the growth of our companies, but it's the growth of our own personal growth as well. Um, and I will say that um, while I may not be the best father, out, no, I, I'm, I may not, I am not the best father out there or the best husband out there, certainly. Um, in learning how to be a good leader, I learned so much about myself that it did bleed into my personal life as well. No, that's a good point. Um... Honestly, a lot of the self-development and inner work I've been doing is making an impact in my marriage and my ability to be a better, more present mother. And it's really transformed my life. I mean, we're in the thick of it. My husband was saying today at our therapist, like, I'm just so proud of you. And I'm seeing all these changes and all this stuff, but it didn't really start out because I wanted to, to do all that for me initially, it was really is for my team. And like, you know, I needed to show up in a different way in a more effective way to drive higher performance as an organization, but ultimately like it's all intertwined and it all starts with you as the human first. I was so impressed when you said you started when you were 17. And uh, I mean, that's remarkable, right? Because most people, you know, are still learning and maturing and, and, and not ready to, to start specifically that age, if not older, right? One of the things about recruiting is the importance of selling. And I think both of you know the importance of being able to sell yourself, sell ideas, sell, sell people, right? So can you talk about that? I think a lot of people are scared of selling. We have young people on this, uh, on this Zoom chat. And I wanted to, you to talk about that a bit more, what, you know, for people, well, talk about sales in general, right? Yeah. And how young people should, should view it. Yeah, for me, I always looked at it not as selling, but just sharing information. So my approach was never to sell a candidate or to paint a picture of something that wasn't accurate or, you know, would mislead people. Like if I had a really challenging role or a challenging hiring manager, and we've seen a lot of those, um, I wasn't going to misrepresent that and sell somebody on something that wasn't true. I wanted to show them the good, the bad, and the ugly, and I wanted to share information. So I always led even in my early days of email reach outs and really when I was early days recruiting, we would like mail letters to people's houses to try and get jobs way back in the day. Um, but I always just approached it with like, Hey, I'm a, I'm an evangelist. I just want to tell you about this opportunity. And then you decide if it's for you or if it's not for you, but I'm not going to be pushy about it. And ultimately I'm here to make a connection with you regardless of the outcome. I think the best part about 
what I've been able to do in my career is I never worked at an agency. So I never had like a placement fee. I never had to worry about if I got paid, if, if they didn't take the job or anything like that. So it really was much on a deeper relationship building level for me. And it always has been, I think some recruiters who work at agencies, it is telling and they have a quota and all of that. And they might misrepresent opportunities or misrepresent people and not make the right connections. So I think if you take the word selling and, and like wrap it in just being an evangelist and sharing information, it's not as scary, you know, cause then you can show up in your true authentic, on authentic self and with integrity and just share what you know, share your, share your story, share your company story, whatever it is and, and see what else happens. That's I think for me where the magic happens. Yeah, that's good insight. And you wouldn't, for people who are t- hesitant or tentative, especially young people, you know, when they hear the word sales or, or, you know, and concerned about objection, what would you say to them? I would say, I mean, this is what I've had to learn after probably in 10 years of recruiting, I started learning this. Like the no isn't about you. Like you, you can't control other people, right? So you can educate, you can share, you can evangelize and people have choices and they decide what makes sense for them. But if they say no, it's not a rejection. Like I kind of look at it, you know, what's the saying? Like rejection is redirection. Like people have choices. It's not a big deal. I used to take it personally. I have, you know, candidate would decline an offer and I'd have a meltdown and be like, oh my God, I tried everything. Why didn't this work out? Now I'm just like, okay, well, it's not for them. On to the next thing. You kind of just got to keep rolling with it. Don't get hung up on the no's or the rejections. Got it. And Mike, what can you talk about? Yeah. So the, so rejection is the key here because the, the, the people who are reluctant to sell or who are fearful of selling, it's really the fear of rejection that's at play. And so I, I when, when I was running an incubator for a while, um, we took a cohort and brought in a salesperson to teach them how to do cold calls. And then one of their assignments was to make a list of a hundred prospects and cold call them in one day. Um, that, you know, that will knock the fear of rejection out of you, right? You won't, <laughs> the fact is that all you're looking for is that one conversation in a day, right? And, you know, five people will be sorry that they picked up the phone and 95, nine, the other 95 people will be, uh, won't even be there to, and, and won't even answer. And it's just to understand that that one good conversation is worth the, uh, you know, the, the 95 other ones that aren't or that don't even happen. Um, now, and to me is, is, you know, wearing my coaching hat, right. Getting over, and I apologize, the landscapers chose this hour to come and do the trimming and, and, and air, uh, uh, blowing. So sorry about that. If it, if it's, if it's, if it's visible on the audio here, um, the, the, the fear, one of the things as entrepreneurs, we have to be able to do is conquer our fears, right? And when you look at what fears are, right, they're things that haven't happened, right? They are emotions tied around things that haven't happened and likely won't happen. Um, And so adapting ourselves to understanding fear and overcoming fear make us better entrepreneurs, period, right? So it's not just the fear of selling, right? The fear of hiring, the fear of delegating, the fear of, of presenting, Right. Um, there, there's a lot of fears that we see in entrepreneurs and, and the success comes when you overcome those fears. That's great. A great way to put it, too. Um, all right. So let's move on to the community. Right. Mike, you see a lot of folks in your community, not only locally, but regionally and, and beyond. What are you seeing as far as. Um, First of all, we've just been through a horrific year. On the other hand, some businesses have done well, a lot you know, have been um, hurt. Talk about what you've seen and, and how you're seeing us get out of this and what you're seeing with some of your clients and some of the people you come into contact with. Yeah, uh, by and large, uh, the, the, what, in, what initially happened at the beginning of the pandemic was a lot of fear again, over being set back several years. That was Q2. And Q3, a lot of people will say, hmm, my worst quarter ever. But then uh, Q, uh, Q2, Q3, Q4, things started to pick up. Q1 was really strong. And what we've seen is the fear of being set three year, back three years 
for many businesses wasn't a setback at all. And for some businesses, it was a setback a lot. Now there are sectors, you know, like a catering sector that's not, you know, that, that was irreparably damaged, but even the hotels and the airlines that, you know, the tourist destinations who complained that, um, you know, we're never going to recover, you know, you, I, I priced airfares from Philly to Dallas last night, $1,700 for coach. Right? Um, it was, it, it, it is, the demand is incredible. Um, and so what we're seeing is businesses bounce back stronger than ever, <clears throat> especially in the B2B services businesses where we're seeing, we're seeing unexpected growth, um, well, unexpected levels of growth and unexpected confidence in, in the clients who are hiring them. Uh, so all of that is good. I, I can't, you know, again, we're only, we're only, we're not even at the end of this 14 month saga, but what we're seeing is um, we're coming out of this, in my perspective, stronger than when we went into it. Well, that's encouraging. Tom, how about you? Yeah, I agree with all of those sentiments. I'm in B2B services and I can tell you we've never been as busy and had as much growth as we've had in the last six months, but it hasn't not been painful. It's been pretty challenging. Um, it's like every client we have didn't hire last year. And so they're all coming in real hot with demands and they're behind their hiring goals. And I know my recruiters um, on the front lines are languishing and you know last year we're fearing fearing for their lives and jobs and then this year are so overworked and so super busy and everyone's yelling at them and not happy like it's it's been a lot so for us it's exciting growth um a little bit painful and i'm just trying to balance like keeping up pace with the everything that's opening up in front of us at the same time like keeping my team's mental health and well-being at the forefront because they're the ones that are copying a lot of it, which gets me back to like being conscious and being able to be still and chill and like centered when all this chaos is happening because there's so many businesses that are growing again. And most of the leaders there are not conscious and they're just like on autopilot and just dispersing all their energy out. Um, so it's been like, for us, it's been a little bit stressful, um, but it keeps like resonating with me. Like, this is how we want to show up. We want to show up as conscious recruiters and connectors. I said yesterday, like, imagine a world in which recruiting was an actual enjoyable experience. Because if you ask anyone who's done it before, they're always like, yeah, it kind of sucks. Like, oh, it's pretty hard or whatever. But imagine if we could lead and pave the way of the conscious connector recruiting movement where we are chill and we like, take it down a few notches for our clients who are not chill and how would that feel for people? Um, but businesses are growing. Like if we're growing, they're growing, you know, like I think in Q1 alone, my team filled 80 roles across this handful of clients and we're probably going to do double that this quarter. So that to me has been exciting coming off the year that we were coming off and, you know, not seeing that growth. So talk about the shortage. I mean, there, there, there's all this talk about there's a shortage of talent. What is, I mean, all the historical data says, you know, there's a, there's a surplus after a recession of, of, of talent, right? And, but in all industries, it seems there is a shortage. So what, can you talk more about that from your perspective, Dom, and yours, Mike? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that what we're seeing is candidates, at least the talent that, that we're talking to, um, for highly skilled talent, engineering, product management, creative and design, they're in demand. Everybody's sitting them up. Everyone wants to hire the same type of people in the same like mid to senior level career person um, is very in demand. So they're calling the shots at the candidates market again. They're the ones dictating whatever their price is, when they want to work, how they want to work. Like it's a whole different ball game than it was before where everyone like had to be at an office, even for us. Two years ago, my clients wanted recruiters in their offices. We were a fully remote team always. So they had a lot of heartburn with, we don't want to hire a fully remote recruiting team. We don't think you could do your jobs, blah, blah, blah. Now that's totally stripped back, but that's stripped back across a lot of different functional areas of most tech companies as well. So even though it's been challenging, uh, remote first and all of that, 
I think people now feel more empowered and are just laying down the law. This is where I want to work, how I want to work, blah, blah, blah. And they're sticking to that and they have a lot of options. So that's creating the talent shortage. We've seen nothing short of like people accepting offers, then not showing up or rejecting offers and taking other offers, counter offers. Like it's just a bit, a lot of what we used to think of anomaly situations are the norm now. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's been, it's hard, it's harder to close candidates as well than it ever was. I think even given the money that's out there and the offers that we're able to pull together, people are still just, they're very specific too. I think values are coming up a lot. People are wanting to work for values-based organizations or values first organizations. And if they get into a place and they see that those values aren't actually being exhibited or lived, then they're out of there and they're not going to waste their time anymore because as we experienced last year, life's too short. So people are just, the, the workforce has just changed so much in the last 14 months. And, and does that sort of point back to pe- do people really want balance? They're concerned about their mental health. You know, I mean, obviously it's been a very difficult year mental health wise. And now the ones who have the talent, obviously it's a seller's market, right? And they also really value remote work, flexibility, and, you know, they're concerned about, you know, stress and mental health, right? Yeah. No, I think burnout is so real. I'm seeing it across my own team now. Um, And I think it's just very real at most places because working from home is one thing. Working from home in a pandemic is another thing. And then working 24-7 on demand, how we're all expected to be is just a whole other level of crazy. So I think right now... um, people know that people who are, you know, even people who I've seen that were impacted by the pandemic and laid off aren't rushing to get jobs. They'll get jobs when they want to get jobs right now. They're, they're in high demand and they could probably have a million jobs, but they're like, no, I'm going to take the time for me. And I'm going to decompress because I've been working in crazy places for a long time. And right now my mental health and well being is above priority above everything. Yeah, I definitely think that's affecting the shortage, right? YOLO, yeah. you know, you only live once and <laughs> you want to take this break if they can and afford to. And, and how could you, how could we um, fault them for it, right? Mike, what do you see? Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, to, to add on to this, I think what we're seeing is organizations are less well-oiled than they used to be right? Because for decades, we were just doing it the same way. And we were, and, and, and it may have not been, you, you know, you, Dom, you, you talk about values, right? So it, it may have not been aligned with the values of the people who are working with you or for you. But, um, but we knew we knew how to run a company. And we ran it that way. And then the pandemic starts to create all these distractions that, you know, geographic and physical distractions, the emotional distractions, it gets really complicated and, and, and companies start to re, you know, have to, you know, not start to, but are forced to adjust to it. And what happens is they, they start to ease up. So now we're getting less done with the same amount of people. So first now demand increases partly because of growth right now, but before this, it was just because we needed to, we needed to, add on more roles to get some of the work done. Um, for a lot of that, there was enough workforce. It's the growth part that I think we can, that we, we can't fill it right now. And that's a separate issue, not a separate, separate from what we've discussed so far about a, 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 an economic gap that keeps widening in, in, in our communities um, between the kinds of jobs that we're creating and the kinds of, the kinds of um, talent and workers that we're, that we're, that we're um, training. So there's a big gap there that that I know that other speakers on on your show, Jim, have have addressed, and that's going to continue to be an issue um, and and take take a long time to solve as well. But um, the other thing I'm seeing is a lot of churn of talent. So now that now that the market's so hot, um, people are feeling a little bit more confident to put feelers out there, yeah. and and so I'm seeing a lot of employers start to scramble to replace people who they thought were pretty comfortable in their jobs for eight or 10 years. And turns out, you know, with an, have, their eyes have been opened, right? Their, their, their employees' eyes have been opened, partly because as you point out, we now have remote and hybrid capabilities in many companies, um, but also because it is the, the, the shortage is so prominent that the number of opportunities that someone has in front of them is now more obvious than it used to be. 
Got it. Are you seeing like, um, I feel like I'm still seeing this might just be a tech thing, like growth for growth sake, but not really slow, intentional, thoughtful growth. I'm seeing like all of a sudden we're behind and let, let's just add 500 people. Let's spatter them out wherever because we need to be hyper growth because that's the cool thing to do. But I feel like in some cases, organizations aren't really being thoughtful about how they're really scaling their organizations or even how they're going to absorb. Like if you're a 500 person company and you're going to double that by the end of this year, like how are you going to effectively absorb those people on board, assimilate, train, ensure that they can deliver quality work? Like they don't really think about this. They just get excited because they have some funding and then it's growth for growth sake and it then becomes very messy. Yeah. And, and I, so I'll say personally, I haven't seen as, I, I've, I've observed that from afar and I've certainly read that. Um, but most of the companies that I'm working closely with are between 200 and uh, between 20 and 200 people and almost all of them are bootstrapped. Mm -hmm. And, and so they, they, they hire people very differently. So mm -hmm. they're not, they're not, uh, I'm not seeing that um, in my immediate circles, but I, I do think, I do think that's the case because, you know, look, I, I, the, the housing market is as tight as the job market. So I've decided to sell my house, mm -hmm. right? And we'll put it on the market in a few weeks. And within three days, I'll have 40 offers. And, you know, and why did I put it on the market? Well, because the market's so hot. And so I'm sure that's going on. It's like, well, let me, you know, let, let's grab inventory. Let's grab, you know, people before they all, they, they all commit to somewhere else. Because the minute they take another job, they're going to probably stay there for a few years. So let me get them now. So it may be, I guess, I hate to, to, to talk about people this way, but it might be panic buying. These companies mm -hmm. might be in that panic buying mode mm -hmm. of let me add as many people as I can, as quickly as I can. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's really interesting. So we're going to get the questions shortly uh, in just a few minutes. But before we do, I wanted to ask, you know, we've just gone through a lot of really great insights. What about advice for entrepreneurs, right? Um, let's just talk about that, right? We just spoke about talent. Should they be, you know, well, you should always be sort of hiring, right? So they say, but what, what's the advice that you're giving to entrepreneurs on not only on the talent side, but in general, um, you know, as we sort of pivot to post pandemic here? Yeah, I think right now where I'm at and what I think about as an entrepreneur is growth. Like we are growing, I'm riding the wave and I'm loving it. So I'm going with that. And I, I would advise entrepreneurs, like if you're not growing, then, then what are you doing? If you're not growing, are you refining? Are you paring down and leveling up? your team and yourself, like if it's not growth that you're after, then what's the next thing that you're after and what are you doing to work towards that? But then when it comes to hiring and talent, I always say this and now I live it because I didn't live it. Like really hire slow and thoughtfully. Don't rush into it. And it's going to be messy if you do. Like hire slow and fire fast. If there are people in your organization that are a cancer and don't do, you know, don't align with your values and are negative and toxic, it gets, it's like wildfire, it spreads. And so I'm very protective now of the culture that we're building here. And we're also in like a cultural transition now that I'm on my new conscious leadership journey, like we're turning over because I don't want my team to be all stressed out how I was for the last few years. I'm really trying to change that, but you know, be aware of the talent that you're hiring, hire slow, be thoughtful, and really hire people who align with the values that you set for your organization. Those are like my biggest takeaways. And what's the one thing besides money that uh, employers or entrepreneurs can offer their new hires? What's the one thing that um, could make the difference? I think time, time and, you know, patience and, and training and onboarding. Like I, learned the hard way and made a lot of assumptions, even hiring a junior team that people just would walk in and understand and know this business and get it as quickly as I had gotten it. Cause I was like heads down for 20 years doing it. But now I'm spending a lot of time with my juniors and my team and doing master classes every week and really letting them get my brain trust in a more thoughtful way, instead of trying to cram in a bunch of hodgepodge half-ass training. So I think, you know, beyond um, money, just spending time with your people. Got it. All right, Mike. 
so, so, so clearly people are important and I would want to talk more about people, but I want to throw in a couple of other concepts here. And, well, actually maybe one important one. And that's, we've started to shift given this new world that we are entering, that we are in really. Um, so we started to shift encouraging people to do annual plans, to do quarterly plans instead. You, you need to be in a very tight planning cycle. Um, you know, 2020 and the beginning of 2021 blew away all our assumptions, right? For better or for worse. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, the, the people market very unpredictable right now. And so, so with all of, with the challenges and being able to come up with assumptions that are, that are safe, um, you know, in, in business performance, uh, you know, we can say that past performance, especially with people, right? Past performance does indicate future performance. Um, maybe not in the stock market, but certainly, certainly in businesses. And 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 so we want to. Um, we can't. We don't know that anymore. We don't know that the way it worked in 2019 is what's going to work in 2022. In fact, we can probably be sure that it will. It won't work, and it has to be different. We just don't know how it'll be different. That's why we have to become more nimble. And if we are become, if we plan our businesses and run our businesses um, more nimble, then we're going to become more resilient and we're going to adapt to change a lot more quickly. Got it. Yeah. And what about talent? Anything uh, you want to add to that, Mike? Um, it, 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 Dom's made a, a bunch of great points. I, I'm a, a huge proponent of, of hire slow, fire fast. Um, Firing fast is one of the biggest mistakes that that most leaders <laughs> um, make. They fail to do that. Um, the um, the but the important thing to me is values based hiring. Don mentioned values uh, several times, and it really is. You know, we you, people talk about company culture a lot, and I'm not one to talk about company culture. Culture comes from the people who you choose to put into the company, right? So the culture gets built from the bottom up, not the top down, especially in a remote or hybrid environment, right? Where it's no longer about the free lunches or the ping pong tables, which used to define what we called culture. It's the people who you hire. If you hire people aligned to a certain value, a certain set of core values, then you're going to use that as the tool to create the culture that that you want in your company. So um, so values based hiring. Um, you know, look, it, skills require change evolution all the time. We're constantly changing our skills, um, developing new ones, um, acquiring new knowledge. Values never change. So yeah. so we should be we should be looking at talent for for uh, the value that the values they align with. Sure. Um, and and let's just I just want to tease that tease into a bit more about uh, generations, right? We hear all about people complaining about generations, generational conflict. Dom, what's your what's your take on that? Is that overblown? Is that you know something that uh, more attention should be paid to, or what? No, I do see that a lot, and I've seen it even in my own organization. We have a multi generational workforce um, ourselves, and. Initially, I think I was probably a lot harder on the earlier generations and earlier career people and had my own set of biases and assumptions about what they should know, but also now learning that they come into the, this workforce remote first, and it's kind of like shell shock if they, if they were on school campus and things like that. So I'm trying to be and teach my leadership team to be more patient and like really we we continue to work with our teams to like teach them how to work like it sounds dumb but it's really what you have to do with some of the earlier career folks um i think for mid to senior levels and and other generations you know it's important to for at least for me to keep growing your skills and not have a fixed mindset a few years ago we had some very senior people on the team that are no longer here because they were so stuck in their way. They didn't want to learn a new way or our way or whatever way they just didn't want to learn. They were really finite and that made it super challenging. So I think there, there are a lot of conflicts and there are a lot of conversations around generational differences in the workforce and all of that. But honestly, like no matter where you're at, if you 
have a growth mindset and you're kind of open junior or senior, like that's going to be a good tool in your tool belt as you navigate this whole, you know, next generation of the workforce and remote first and all of that. Great. Thank you. Mike, do you want to add anything there? Um, I think it was Teddy Roosevelt who said that people don't care what you think until they think that you care. <laughs> and um, so it, it doesn't matter what generation, if, if you're a leader, a manager, an employer who takes interest in people, then they'll follow, right? That's the, uh, so it, and it doesn't matter whether they're, you know, right out of college or, um, you know, or 30 years into their career. Um, uh, you know, any, you know, read anything by Brene Brown, right? But the, the, the vulnerability, the empathy that we're going to build in our organizations is what our teams want. And, and I think that spans generations. So I don't, I don't think we need to talk. I don't, I don't think it's an issue anymore. I don't, I don't, I mean, I think maybe it was just a, when we were operating our businesses the way we had been operating them for decades. And we had this all of a sudden, this new workforce come in that we didn't know how to deal with. Um, it, it, um, it was something that we needed to think about. But, um, but today I think that the, the lines are all blurred, um, the new working style, the, what we've learned about how to build teams and how to, how to maintain teams. It's not about, it's about caring about people. It's not about, you know, you know, which generation they're from, I think today. All right, let's get to some questions. So here's a question. One of the limiting beliefs that you see most often with CEOs and founders. Hmm. That's a good one. There's so many. I don't even know where to start because I had all of them for the longest time. Um, I think just speaking from my own experience, two years ago when I decided to like come out to my clients and say like, I'm building my business. I have a team. I'm going to train them up, blah, blah, blah. They're going to be like me and deliver how I've delivered for 20 years. I had major imposter syndrome because I had never done it. I didn't think I was capable. Even though I had a 20 year track record, I was like, didn't it didn't register to me that I had been doing it successfully at scale across all of these hundreds of companies for such a long time. So I just didn't feel capable. So I think that was one limiting belief is that I couldn't do it or wasn't capable or wasn't good enough. And I think the second thing is being a woman in tech was another big thing that kept coming up was like, how I'm going to go pitch my company to a, another startup tech founder with some funding and tell him to trust me to build his organization. Like I can't do that. I'm scared. So I just didn't feel capable. It was major imposter syndrome for me personally. Got it. Mike. Uh, like Dom said, there's so many of them and, and let's see what's, what's the ones I, I saw today. Um, <laughs> the, the, um, uh, we've been talking about the Pareto principle a little bit, the 80-20 rule, right? You know, the perfectionism that that some entrepreneurs have is is holding them back. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, I sometimes tell them 80% is 100%. You're done. Go on to the next thing. Um, same thing is true. That, that, that extends to how they hire, right? Well, nobody can do it as, as well as I can. Like, well, you might not be doing it as well as you think you are. <laughs> um, so, so there, the, the, the reluctance to delegate, and I, I don't know if I call that, call that a limiting belief, but it is holding back a lot of entrepreneurs um, that they're not going to do it as well as I, I do. They not going to, um, they're not going to work as hard as I work. Mm -hmm. um, and so so I think, uh, I think um, you know, delegation is, is a limiting belief. Got it. And then what are the beliefs that are the most productive? I think your self-belief, your self-love, like, and also just having, giving yourself a little bit of grace. I was just talking to one of my directs before this meeting and she was challenged with where she's at in her growth and she's not growing fast enough for herself. And I'm just like, can we pause for a minute? And can you just say, I'm doing a good job and I'm really proud of where I'm at right now. Like, just stop. Don't think about all the future stuff. Be in the present moment and go, wow, I came really far really quickly and I'm not quite where I want to be, but I'm doing great. Like that internal validation and self-belief I think is 
empowering, especially as an entrepreneur, because you're the only one that's going to tell you to keep going and to keep doing it. Like I didn't have some big hype team behind me. I had a team, but they weren't like pumping up my tires when, you know, for two years straight telling me to do this. Like I had to tell myself, like, you can do this. You're, you know, what's going to happen if you do it more? And like, what's the bigger vision and the bigger vision. And I think you just have to be your own like cheerleader and advocate. Mm. And I was going to, that was one of the first I was going to, I was going to suggest is this positivity. Um, We, you know, we, we used, (coughs) excuse me, you know, maybe we used to call it optimism, um, glass half full, but it's really about positivity. Cause even, even in, in when things are bad, when we're not feeling successful, right. If we can frame that in a positive way, right. So it's a learning opportunity. It's a, it's a stepping stone. It's one step back and two steps forward. There's ways to frame um, everything that we encounter in a positive way. Um, and the same thing is true in our leadership throughout our team. So positivity is certainly a big thing. A lot of work in, in positive psychology and positive intelligence now. Share just one thing that you've learned during this pandemic that others you know, you know, might uh, learn from. One thing. All right, Dom, you want to go first? Yeah, I'll go. Um, I read an amazing book, The Power of Now and Being Present. So in the pandemic, I have been becoming more present than I've ever been. And that's been so super powerful. And it's, it's been able to allow me to be positive and, and take lessons from challenges that come our way and setbacks and not, and not be a victim and not give away my power and not look at everything as happening to me, but look at, okay, what's the, what's the lesson here? Okay. I sit with the lesson and then I'm moving forward or I'm not reacting to a criticism and having worry and doubt and start second guessing. I'm just very present. So power of now is very powerful to get into the moment. Thank you, Mike. Measure everything <laughs> and write it down. <laughs> um, if, if anything that we've learned in this pandemic, it's that um, knowing how to track is will in, let us know where we are along the path, whether it's individuals or teams or the progress of our business. Um, everything can be measured. Everything probably should be measured and we should keep track of it. Great, thank you. And what about, um, where can people find um, courses or classes or, or, or programs where they can improve their leadership skills? I can go. Um... For me, I've done a lot of Akimbo workshops, love Seth Godin and all of his workshops. I just started a new one today called the Copy Workshop for a month. Um, so I've loved a lot of his work. Mike, I'm sure you have a laundry list of them too. I, I, I do and I don't. I, I do and I don't in, in the fact that there's so much out there and there's really no one resource mm-hmm. that, that, that I would say this is amazing. Um, because it's, I, I, you need to align the resources around the specifics of the person, yeah. right? And that's why we do a lot of strengths assessment to understand how do we build on the strengths to, to, to close the gaps. But the, so, so let me, let me, I recently wrote about like the four elements of professional development and, and, you know, clearly well, I'm, I'm a big proponent of coaching. Everyone should have a coach. Everyone should have training to your question. We should, we should find a way to train everyone. Everyone should have a mentor, right? That, 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 that older, wiser person who's been in your shoes, who builds an emotional relationship with you. And you should have peer support. You should be surrounded by, you should be part of a peer group of people going through the same thing that you're going through. Cover all four of those components and, and someone will develop into an amazing leader. Uh, that is great advice. Uh, and you ha- your website has some great articles uh, that I've learned stuff from. It's really, Thank you. really I, I recommend that. And, Trajectify, right? Trajectify.com. Exactly. Okay, got it. So why don't we do this? Why don't we, um, every time I have a show, I ask for poems. So why don't you, uh, ladies first, Don, why don't you read us out with a poem or sing uh, to to conclude this uh, program? Yeah, the quote that I picked was Steve Jobs. The only way to do great work is to love what you do. And I share that with my team in our last audience. Great. Mike? 
Well, I, I used one of my favorite quotes already in this talk, but so I, I was looking through poems and, and, and I kept scratching off all my favorite poems, like that's not appropriate, that's not appropriate, that's not appropriate. So finally I found one by Ogden Nash that I was a big, as a, as a kid growing up, huge fan of Ogden Nash. Um, so it's only four lines, but um, I'll, I'm, and I'm sure I'll butcher it. Consider the auk, an animal, right? Consider the auk becoming extinct because he forgot how to fly and could only walk. Consider man who may well become extinct because he forgot how to walk and learned how to fly before he thinked. Lovely. Yeah, you'll, you have to sleep on that one. <laughs> <laughs> or at least read it. <laughs> Well, Mike and Dom, thank you so much for doing this. This has been this has been really great, really informative, and uh, you know, thanks for being thanks for being leaders in in the community. Really appreciate that. Thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please like it, leave a review, and subscribe. See you soon.